बोलने वाला आदमी है क्यों क्यों मैं कम बोलता हूं एक सूत्र है कि जो मैंने सीख लिया है कि मौन मूर्खक के भूषण ज्यादा बोलना अच्छा नहीं वो विद्वानों का काम है लेकिन जो हम बोले उसी के ऊपर हम न चल सके तो हमारा बोलना नुकसान का ही The historic Sabarmati River in Ahmedabad, from the banks of which Gandhi led the national struggle till 1928. Also on its banks, a little further away, is another historic monument, Shahi Bagh. It is today a memorial to Sardar Patel, and like all memorials and statues, a symbol of our struggle against forgetting. And yet, memories cannot be lived fossilized. Today, when our public life has been marred by deep erosion of values, the time has come to take the memories of great leaders like the Sardar out of the deep freeze of museums and into our present. Safdarjan Airport, then Willingdon Airfield. The Sardar was here on the 27th of October 1947, watching a sortie start and another end, and waiting for the return of VP Menon with news from Kashmir. Kashmir was one of the 565 princely states in existence then. 565 princely states, some smaller than five square kilometers, but all pampered by the British and allowed to live under the illusion of being free, and given the option of joining either India. Pakistan or remaining independent. What would the new India have been like, minus the princely states and minus Pakistan? A mutilated land with its edges crumbling, its fabric ridden with innumerable holes, holes that could easily tear apart the nation to shreds. It was in the strategic interests of all concerned that this be prevented. The job of integrating these princely states into the Indian Union required great tact, diplomacy, and a deep understanding of human nature. The Sardar convinced all the states to join in, with the exception of Kashmir, Junagadh, and Hyderabad. Junagadh caved in, but there had to be police action before the Nizam of Hyderabad surrendered. a small town halfway between Ahmedabad and Baroda in Gujarat. It was a town of twisting streets and 25,000 people when Vallabhai was born here. His mother, Lagba, gave him birth in an inner room of this house belonging to her brother, Dungir Bhai, where she had come for her confinement. Vallabhai's childhood was spent not in Nadiar but in Karamsad, 12 miles north, where his father Zaveer Bhai tilled a 10-acre plot and owned a house. Vallabhai's parents had six children. Vallabhai was the fourth. It is conjectured by some that this status of being a middle child had a share in the making of his extraordinarily strong and independent personality. Zaveer Bhai was burdened with debt and his involvement in the Swami Narayan sect led him to become more and more a recluse and detached from his home. Deprived of adequate parental love, remembered last when clothes and sweets had to be shared and first when any work needed to be done, Vallabhai learned very early to fend for himself. At school, interesting character traits began to reveal themselves in the personality of little Vallabh. The Nadiad High School saw the emergence of a rebellious, mischievous, but witty schoolboy who played little tricks on his teachers and regaled his friends with puns and jokes. 
the school register recording Vallabhai's name still exists. His strong willful character and resistance to injustice, even at the cost of incurring the wrath of his teachers, earned him the names Stormy and Outlaw. Vallabhai's family was indifferent to his education. He could easily, like his brothers Soma and Narsi, have taken to tilling the land. But he had other plans for himself. At the age of 22, he passed his metric and later qualified as a district pleader. And then he began to save up money for his dream, to go to England for his barristership. Vallabhai wanted to leave for England, but it was not to be. His wife Zaverba died suddenly of an intestinal ailment at the tender age of 29 years. When he actually set out for his barristership to England, he was a man already 35 years of age. In him, a down-to-earth patidar, a widower who had saved money for it twice over, was going to England. Not a young romantic or a political anarchist. He knew he had not much time. Only a few yards away from the courts in Ahmedabad is the Gujarat club, where many lawyers would assemble to play bridge, smoke, gossip and discuss politics. When Vallabhai returned from England and set up a successful practice as a criminal lawyer, he spent many evenings here playing bridge. At the club, Vallabhai discovered that he was quite good at bridge. The image of Vallabhai Patel during this time is quite unlike that to be expected of a future nationalist leader. Just across the street from the Gujarat club was Vallabhai's Bhadra house. At this juncture, his interest in politics was minimal. He was scornful of the methods of the Indian nationalists which then revolved around either making petitions or throwing bombs. And then in 1915, an event of staggering importance took place. Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi arrived on the Indian national scene from South Africa with his new weapon of the Satyagraha. Vallabhai greeted this news with skepticism. One day when Gandhi arrived in the Gujarat club to address a meeting, Vallabhai talked of him from his bridge table with great sarcasm and made everybody laugh. However, destiny had planned otherwise. Vallabhai, like many others, would soon be irrevocably drawn into Gandhi's magnetic field, never to return to his earlier life. It was to this waiting spirit in Vallabhai that Gandhi showed the way. Armed struggle rarely led to the arms being laid down after the struggle was won. Gandhi appeared onto the national scene with a new weapon, that of Satyagraha or non-violent resistance to oppression. The method had already proved effective in Champaran. Vallabhai, the man of action, was impressed. He joined the Kheda and Nagpur flag Satyagras as Gandhi's lieutenant and in the days spent by his side, he silently observed Gandhi's methods. Thus began a 30-year relationship between Gandhi and Vallabhai, which was to have such a significant impact on the struggle for Indian independence. Vallabhai's house in the Swaraj ashram in Bardoli Even long after the Bardoli struggle was won, the house and the Swaraj ashram continued to be the centre of political activity in Gujarat.
an old Haveli in Bardoli. These quiet houses and lanes were mute witness to the classic experiment in Satyagra that was carried out here in 1928 under the leadership of Vallabhai Patel. The British government had increased the tax on land. When all appeals to bring it down fell on deaf ears, the men and women of Bardoli launched a movement of complete non-cooperation. No barber would shave government servants, no carriage would carry them, and drums would be played when a government official entered the village, warning the villagers, and the streets would immediately become deserted. When the people refused to pay the land tax, their land was forfeited and cattle seized. The people of Bardoli remained firm and drew inspiration from Vallabhai, whom they fondly referred to as their Sardar. With the success of Bardoli, Vallabhai, the hero of the hour, was the natural choice for the presidentship at the annual congress session at Lahore in 1929. Yet, Gandhi preferred Jawaharlal, and bowing to Gandhi's wishes, Patel withdrew. The Lahore session was historic because, for the first time, Congress made complete independence its main goal and unfurled the tricolor on the banks of the river Ravi. Often, while recounting the story of the national movement, what takes center stage are the more dramatic and tangible events like campaigns, agitations, marches. And the stage was now set for one more nationwide campaign and this time a decisive one, the historic Quit India Movement. Preempting the movement, the British arrested all the major national leaders in a single sweep and the Sardar found himself along with Nehru, Azad, Kriplani and others in the Ahmednagar jail. In the nearly 30 months that he spent here, he had to confront an uncertain future, indifferent health and the fact that at 68, he had very little time left. Vallabhai and Maniben had an extraordinary relationship, rare between a father and a daughter. She lived with the Sardar, looked after him, travelled with him, regulated his appointments and maintained a detailed diary of his movements and meetings. From 1927 onwards, she even spun all the yarn that covered his body. One year ago, we made a trip with destiny, and now the time comes. Freedom came at midnight on the 15th of August, 1947. Only or in full measure, but very substantially. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world preached, India will await to life and freedom. Sardar Patel, who had contributed so much to the struggle for independence, did not speak on the occasion. Power had changed hands. Those who had so far resisted and opposed the rulers were now the new rulers of India. Once again, when it was time to choose a leader for the new India, it was not the organizer, the silent man of action, but the charismatic and popular visionary who donned the mantle of prime ministership. The Sardar became independent India's home minister and deputy prime minister. had the euphoria of freedom abated, when came the horrors of the patrician. The demographic character of Delhi altered forever in the post-patrician rioting, as a large segment of the capital's Muslim population had to leave the country and vast numbers of Hindu and Sikh refugees came in.
These were trying times for the nation and especially for the Home Minister who was responsible for handling the situation. Sardar managed this in the most effective and pragmatic way that he could. To the Sardar, the sovereignty of the country was of utmost importance. Whatever needed to be done to preserve it just had to be done. This explains the manner in which he executed the integration of the princely states. He did the job surely, swiftly and ruthlessly, using appeasement, persuasion and if required, even force. He was at that time a man already 72 years old. Kashmir, the one state which he wasn't allowed to tackle, is a wound that continues to fester even today. A winter morning at Lodi Gardens, where Sardar would often come for a morning walk from his official residence at 1 Aurangzeb Road. The greatest source of pain to him were the growing differences that had arisen between him and the most important and beloved man in his life, Gandhi. Differences that had so far been kept under rain, so much so that he had earlier been described as a blind follower of Gandhi. But now, like Nehru, he deferred with Gandhi on an issue of utmost importance to the country, the acceptance of partition and the matter of payment of 35 crore rupees to Pakistan. Though these issues were resolved politically, they left a sense of hurt in the relationship. Gandhi and Sardar were to meet for a heart-to-heart -heart talk at 4 p.m. at Birla House on the 30th of January 1948. What transpired on this fateful day has gone down in the annals of history. The events of that day were described in utter anguish by the man of few words in a broadcast on All India Radio. दुख, शोक और परम का है। एक नौजवान हिंदू ने गांधी जी को प्रार्थना की जगह पर जाते अपने पिस्तौल चलाते तीन गोली चलाए। In November 1950, he fell ill. When Mani heard the words of the bhajan, Mangal Mandir Kholo, on his lips, she knew that the end was near. The Sardar passed away on the 15th of December 1950, leaving behind him a legacy of selflessness, courage and determination.